the challenges facing our world are growing all the time. How do we build stronger economies with equal opportunities for all? How do we build a sustainable world for generations to come? How do we protect our cities and harness the power of technology for our common benefit? Humanity has always been good at forward thinking. In this series, using the latest Bloomberg research and analysis, we will make sense of the problems of tomorrow. Sustainability, urbanization, the gender gap, the march of the machines, and the demographic time bomb. And in this film, inequality. It's the issue that preoccupies economists, politicians, and campaigners. What does it mean for the security of our societies and the strength of our economies? Our world is a divided and unequal place. In a competitive economy, you will always have some inequality, and obviously you'll have those who are very successful and some who are less so, but the, the issue is the extreme. 1% of the wealthiest population holds more than half of the world's wealth. 62 wealthiest people hold the same kind of wealth as the lowest 50% of the world population. It's a very striking statistic indeed. If you look at CEO pay, you know, it's gone from about 50 times the average worker 30 years ago to 300 times now, potentially not only does it issue for investors, it's also an issue for, for workers. Inequality has become the hot button economic issue of the 21st century. But worrying about inequality is not new. If we look way back into US history, uh, we saw dramatic income inequality in, for instance, the Gilded Age, the 1880s and the 1890s. Uh, and it went so far uh, and then it collapsed, and policies were put in place by uh, a number of presidents and administrations uh, to sort of uh, equalize the uh, playing field. Uh, labor laws were put in place, tax laws were changed, and that prevailed through the course of World War II and into the 1960s. But then by the 1980s, uh, tax laws were changed and uh, the economy had uh, changed. Uh, and so from the early 1980s to present, uh, we've seen income inequality. Uh, on the rise, it matters because uh, in income inequality eventually contributes uh, to wealth inequality. With wealth comes power in terms of uh, politics and uh, uh, corporate leadership and uh, lots of different uh, uh, facets of the economy. And so when uh, uh, much wealth uh, is held by a very few uh, individuals within an economy or within a country, uh, then those individuals tend to have an outsized uh, degree of control over economic and political policy making and therefore they are able to uh, incorporate policies that will even further increase their levels of wealth. Inequality is about more than fairness. Economists worry extreme levels of inequality can have dramatic effects on the finances of corporations and governments. It really affects uh the pace at which uh, world, the world economy is growing. So uh, to give you an example, the wealthiest, as they uh, get more money, they tend to spend less of a marginal dollar. So this way you get less consumption and consequently uh, less growth in, in the economy. So that's one uh, kind of a consequence. Another thing is that lower and medium income families tend to borrow more to support their consumption and it creates risks. Some of the most dramatic levels of inequality can be seen in the developing world. Here, inequality appears to have a corrosive effect on the whole economy. Something else that we've seen in, in emerging markets is a correlation between inequality um, and corruption levels. Where government is not effective, you aren't necessarily getting education in place and the rules to, to allow everyone to succeed. If you look at the Arab Spring in North Africa and the Middle East, you know, at root cause was you know, economic opportunity. And so if you have this extreme inequality, if you have a lack of economic opportunity, you, know, you could potentially have political unrest. 
If you're at the top of the pile, it's tempting to think inequality does not affect you. But this may be dangerously complacent. Clearly inequality is very bad for the people at the bottom, especially if the bottom is very low. I think at the top, um, there's a potential risk to, you know, what, what could extreme inequality breed? Could it lead to political unrest? Um, could it lead to, to new rules, um, new taxation? So I think, you know, in the short term, even if you're at the, the top of the economic pyramid, you may be very happy with your position. But long term, I think there's potential for, for change, um, which may be destabilizing. If you think about it in a broader sense and uh, think about economic growth and future generations, it's a bad thing because that actually could impact economic growth uh, in, in the world. So I would say that it's a, it's a problem for everybody. One global economist is convinced inequality is dramatically affecting human life in even the richest parts of the world. And that if we want to maximize growth and social cohesion, it's an issue we can no longer ignore. Absolute income inequality is where I think we have to have a real debate. There are clear knock-on effects, and whether there are in education access, um, health care um, uh, options, but also political and life expectancy challenges, it's very much the case that income inequality is now a driver um, in some of these other factors. Inequality is one of the most hotly debated issues in economics, from New York to Nairobi. Dambisa Moyo is a global economist. Her work for the World Bank and on Wall Street has seen her named one of the most influential people in the world. She's fascinated by the biggest trends in economics, from the politics of development in Africa to the price of commodities in China. Now she's turning her attention to inequality. Income inequality is particularly problematic in as much as it is a um, defining factor in many societies for where um, a society's living standards are going. The data on income inequality has shown that it has gotten worse over the last several decades. In fact, over the past 30 years, we have seen income inequality worsen across the United States, the United Kingdom, and across much of Europe. In the same vein, we've seen that the average income of the top 1% in the United States today is 30 times the average income of the rest of the populations, and that rest is the 99%. Um, compare this with 30 years ago, with 1978, when it was simply 10 times um, higher for the top 1%. Economists worry that inequality ushers in a range of social problems. Recent studies in Mexico suggest that neighborhoods with high levels of inequality may suffer more violent crime than those where inequality is less pronounced. Researchers in other nations have come to similar conclusions. A problem with income inequality is the implications and impact that it has on a society. Um, the question being, is it possible for people of different income levels and without prospects of improving their lives to live cheek by jowl? For example, in the United States, the Bronx is the poorest congressional district in the United States. But it's also 20 minutes by train, about five stops, to one of the richest enclaves in the world in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. There are real questions around whether that sort of a living uh, cheek by jowl is actually long-term sustainable, given risks of crime and also destitution. There are knock-on effects for other forms of inequality, such as health or education, and of course, political inequality. In the United States, approximately 158 families are responsible for approximately 50% of campaign funding um, around the U.S. election system. Um, that really does pose the question about where democracy stands and how that might play in um, to the political representation of, um, of the democratic process. Americans have always prided themselves on levels of social mobility within their country the ability of people to get ahead, whatever circumstances they were born into. But some recent evidence suggests this is changing. 
there is a more fundamental aspect to dealing with the income inequality challenge, which I would argue revolves around social mobility. And social mobility really is about people's belief and people's access and opportunity to improving their living standards and their livelihoods over um, the, a, a period of time. I think that the cause of income inequality is the breakdown of social mobility, particularly in the Western societies. So just to give you a flavor for that, um, today in the United States, uh, if you are born into the bottom 20% of the income level, then you have only 5% chance of ending up your life in the top 20% without a college degree. Clearly that suggests that income inequality is widening, um, but I think also it shows that there's a real issue around social mobility and people's ability to actually transform their lives and to move into higher levels of income. As well as hindering social mobility, Extreme levels of income inequality may depress growth across whole economies. The reason that this is so important is that um, the OECD estimates that this is costing those developed countries approximately 8.5% GDP points um, over this period. So put another way, because of income inequality and the widening effects of the gap between the richest and the poorest in the US and across Europe, we have seen GDP growth slow by about 8.5% over the past 25 years. Today, um, there are real concerns about how this bodes for the longer term and for the future. A lot of projections now show that economic growth will be slowing and obviously the knock-on effects of uh, income inequality are likely to be worse. This means inequality is not just a problem for those at the bottom of the economic pile. Chronic income inequality may well affect the social and economic health of everyone. If you are wealthy and living in a uh, in an urban setting, for example, um, the fact that you are every day are dealing with people who have a lower income levels, but more importantly, have fewer prospects to improve their livelihoods, has an absolute and direct impact on your safety, but also on your own living standards to the extent that society as a whole will not likely be growing. And so it's not just about um, lower living standards for those that proportion of society, it's about lower living standards for its entirety in the society because the growth of a society is highly linked to how the average person in society is performing. Dambiza believes the key to tackling inequality lies in reactivating social mobility. But to do that, citizens' basic needs in terms of health and education must be catered for first. I think that the thing that is a paramount and urgency is to ensure that all citizens, and particularly people who are at the lower levels of income, are seeing improvements in their living standards over the long period of time. The real underlying challenges of income inequality in a broader sense, which I would argue really are hitched to the idea of social mobility and the challenges there. But social mobility is propelled by economic growth. And without economic growth, inequality will rise. Just to be absolutely clear on that, we need to aim for at least 7% um, GDP growth every year in order to double per capita incomes in one generation. We are far below that target. So it's really the case that we do have real issues around um, what the long-term prospects for economic growth are, but therefore what the long-term prospects for social mobility and our ability to reduce income inequality are. If the problem of inequality is worrying for the West, then it's compounded in countries with fast-growing, young populations. If these economies are to have any chance of tackling inequality, they must create millions of jobs first. Beyond just the developed countries, of course, there's a real concern around uh, income inequality widening, particularly in the faster growing, largest emerging market economies, such as Brazil, India, South Africa. Today, there are approximately 85 million young people, um, mainly in the emerging markets, between the ages of 18 and 25 that are out of work. If we are going to try and solve the income inequality challenge, we first have to make sure we've got growth, but we also have to make sure that we are providing incomes um, that are growing. Um, to, to this young population. 
We also have to make sure that people have improved access to education and to health care so that they have the social infrastructure to improve their lives and therefore support social mobility. Without those factors, there is a real risk that living standards of not just the impoverished um, percentage of the population, but society as a whole, starts to deteriorate. South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world. Here, the consequences of inequality on the safety of society are visible and real. But businesses are trying to restart social mobility and save the economy. Inequality is one of the defining challenges of our age. In South Africa, the most unequal country on the continent, its consequences can be seen in the continuing poverty of large parts of the country and in the visceral fear of crime that defines the wealthiest suburbs. Taking a look at the big picture uh, and the, uh, the, the well-being of a country in the long run, uh, it is very unhealthy to have this dramatic distribution. Of, uh, of, of wealth and uh, inequality. It will not be a successful model to live in a world where the haves are isolated into communities uh, with very high walls around those communities while the have-nots are uh, sitting at the gates uh, begging for table scraps. In South Africa, there are more private security guards than police officers. They patrol the country's gated suburbs and are the most visible example of an unequal society. Crime is bad. In your home, out of your home, uh, basically all over. I don't want it to sound like it's terrifying. We live with it and uh, we have good lives here. Um, however, trying to keep your family safe, trying to keep your home safe has become more and more difficult and that is what we focus on. CSS Tactical is a Johannesburg-based private security firm employing 750 people. So our approach is very much multiple layers of security. So you would have your armed response, you would have your proactive patrolling. So the, the vehicle is not just sitting under a tree waiting to be dispatched. They're actually present in the area, they're patrolling, they're driving up and down streets. And we've got very intelligent software that actually alerts on unusual behavior. So if you're walking down the streets five o'clock in the afternoon, going home from work, that's normal, but three o'clock in the morning on that side of the street is abnormal. So there's again a tension on what is going on in the suburb as opposed to just sitting under a tree waiting for a, um, an alarm to go off. Fear of crime is splitting Johannesburg in two. The city experienced over 21,000 burglaries last year. Johannesburg is the financial capital, so hence a, a greater concentration of, I guess, wealth and wealthy people, um, lots of stuff to steal, lots of stuff that can that you can see to steal. There's a massive difference between the haves and the have-nots. I mean, the unemployment is rife. Um, and I think, unfortunately, people have not seen that, you know, crime is, is a way to make a living. South Africa is now more unequal than it was under apartheid. But some businesses across the country are actively trying to address this and get social mobility moving again. So I was pregnant with my first daughter um, and I was at home, we lived on a farm, so I was at home during the day and I would chat to the ladies that worked in the fields next door and that sort of thing. And they were um, picking lettuces and, and whatever, but they really had... You know, they, they, were, they had so much inside of them, but they had no opportunity to go anywhere. There was no opportunity for training or to, to get a bit further or anything. And also what I realized, there was no power of possibility. Erin, along with her sister Maeve, decided to set up Manguanani, a health spa. Their plan was to recruit their staff from among the rural poor. It was literally, there's a couple of ladies from the field next door, so everybody went home and found sisters and aunts and whatever that were unemployed, and of course we trained them up. I realized the importance and what my Wanani could actually do in South Africa. I realized that very, very quickly. And realizing then the amount of lives you could change. Christine Budelezi was one of the first women that Erin and Maeve employed. I was on my way, I remember one weekend going to church, 
then I met Maeve who gave me a lift and she started chatting to me. Are you working? What are you doing at the moment? I was still at school and everything. Then I said to her, no, currently I'm working at a farm. It's, it was a chicken farm where we were, we were paid like 20 rand a day. Then she said, but why don't you come and join Mangonania? Then after a week, I said, you know what? I've got nothing to lose. So I went for my training. Then from there, I started working at the spa as a therapist. I started from the bottom, like doing massages, which I really enjoyed it. Then within three months, and I moved into becoming one of the duty managers. And then I think within a year, I was promoted to be a general manager, which for me, it was such a growth in such a small time. Manguanani has become a prolific job creation scheme, expanding across South Africa and propelling women like Christine from rural poverty to senior managerial positions. We estimate that we've trained about 20,000 people. We had ladies that had been with us for say eight, nine years, and it really reached the top. They were now managers. And I'm also proud to say that every single one of our spas is run by a lady who came up through the ranks. Erin is going further, rolling out plans across her 20 spas to give shares in the business to its employees. At the moment, in KwaZulu Natal, our staff own 30% of their business. I wanted them to be part of the business because when you're doing that many treatments in a day, you're giving so much of yourself. By training staff, giving them a route to move up the pay grades and offering them a stake in their own business, Erin hopes her firm can help tackle inequality in South Africa. I can look after my kids. I can look after my family. You know, with us black communities, we've got so many families that we take care of. Like, I'm a breadwinner at home. Everybody depends on me. As much as you've got the other people that are, are working, but most of the time, I'm the one who's taking that whole responsibility. So Mangwanani has given us, like, growth, like given us hope, it, it has made us like dreamers. Inequality has come to define South Africa's economy, but if more can be done to reactivate social mobility, there's a chance that this will not be the case for long. When households are really in a grinding state of poverty, uh, they can't contribute a whole lot uh, to uh, economic well-being. So uh, as uh, lower income demographics are lifted up into uh, working class or middle class uh, thresholds, uh, they tend to be better educated, uh, there's less crime, there's a stronger family structure, uh, and they tend to be a lot more productive uh, in terms of the economy, and they also consume and invest a lot more as well. A strong middle class, a strong working class uh, is really the backbone of a healthy democracy. I feel I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the future. I believe that the path towards um, a world of economic growth, of social mobility, and improved um, income inequality statistics is one that is possible, but not without there being hard choices. Whether it's increasing economic growth, increasing social mobility, we have to make sure that we're addressing those factors to avoid a situation where society and the members of a society become so disaffected. Thank you.